Hello, everyone, and welcome to Phoenix Gaming. Uh, welcome to my first Frosthaven uh, guide video. <clears throat> um, for those of you who are coming here for the Frosthaven, know that the other things I do on this channel is I talk strategy commentary on uh, board games, mostly Euro games that have been played. For those of you who are my Euro game followers, uh, let me give you a quick pitch on why Frosthaven is just one of the best games that's out there. Um, first of all, it's an amazing game because my partner plays it with me. Um, she and I played all the way through Gloomhaven, the entire campaign. We got Frosthaven maybe a month or so ago and just have a delightful time playing this very tactical dungeon crawler uh, together. Frosthaven, I think, is, is in many ways a step up uh, over Gloomhaven. I'm not going to do a review about it today, um, but maybe I'll, I'll do that sometime in the future. Um, you might have noticed behind me, perpetually, my partner and I have Frosthaven set up for quick and easy access on a, on a random weeknight. Um, so largely, I come to this game playing uh, two-player. For those of you who are curious a little bit about kind of like how we play, I've played two-player, three-player, four-player, but mostly we play two-player. Um we in Frosthaven have done nearly 30 scenarios. Uh, we play just the kind of default difficulty of the book. We haven't like upped the difficulty or anything like that. And we have in Frosthaven so far a uh, 100% win rate. Um, we like it that way. It's, it's more fun to progress the story. Um, so we haven't decided to up the difficulty, but we are, I think, pretty good at this game. Um, my partner and I have both retired our first characters. My first character was Bone Shaper. I loved the Bone Shaper. And so I'm going to today talk a little bit about Bone Shaper. Here's my Bone Shaper guide for, for playing Frosthaven uh, if, you, if you are new to this. So if you're watching this video, I'm going to assume that you at the very least know the rules about Frosthaven. Um, but you may or may not know some of the basic kind of tactics and things that are going on here. Um, so the very first thing I want to do before diving even into any of the Bone Shaper's kind of personal materials is actually talk about summoning strategy. Uh, you may have heard kind of the, I'll call it truism, I guess, that uh, going late to summon and then going early to act is kind of a good tempo. What I mean by that is going intentionally late in initiative when you make your summoned creatures and then going um, intentionally early in initiative the next turn so that your summoned creature can act is a valuable thing to understand with the bone shaper so you know for instance going at 90 on one round means that these hounds are going to go before me um, and in this pretty unfortunate scenario where I am in a corner against these hounds this is going to be a, a bad scenario for the bone shaper but bear with me for for practice sakes um, if your plan is to summon somebody this round uh, these hounds might close in on you and attack you, um, and then when you go slowly, you'll summon the skeleton, uh, and then on the beginning of the next round, if you go before the hounds, your skeleton will have an opportunity to attack, and then will um, also split the hits with you because your summons have a lower initiative than you by a half or whatever. They just they break ties for your same initiative number, so this hound will focus on this. And that way you can actually keep your summons alive. Um, if you look at the back of the Bone Shaper uh, guide, one of the things that it's listed for is really high on defense. I think some people would maybe misinterpret that as like throwing your, your skeletons in the way to be roadblocks. I think this kind of sequence is stronger than me going earlier on the previous turn and having the hounds come here and tear this guy's shreds because what's just happened is um, I've essentially not taken any additional damage from these hounds from not being attacked, but I also have no damage output going into the next round uh, other than what I can generate. And as a bone shaper, that's but You're not good at <laughs> generating damage um, outside of your summons. So paying some life to get things um, activated is kind of the way that you want to be going. That being said, this is not a solo game. Um, Bone Shaper should not be in this kind of scenario. You should be moving yourself in such a way that you're not jammed up like this. Um, you should not generally not be the person who's kind of opening doors and getting yourself in a scenario where enemies are going to be jumping on you. Um, you are a backline character for the most part. And so suppose that you are playing with an ally. Um, I want to demonstrate a couple of things that could happen here. So suppose that I went really quickly. I went first and I summoned my skeleton, you know, here or here. What it does is it generates a roadblock, right? That these um, hounds are going to come and attack. And that's fine. I paid two life to summon the skeleton. He then, in turn, you know, takes probably, I mean, the skeleton's got three hit points. 
they also might accidentally overkill him. So ends up taking more than two life worth of damage. It's kind of like I did a mediocre healing preventative or pre preemptive ability. Um, I think, however, the much stronger sequence is to go slowly, have your tank friend move into action. The tank friend can take the hits. Um, and then when you summon your skeleton on the following turn, when you go at really any initiative, whether it's slow or fast, this guy's going to trundle in there and now add some extra damage into the mix. You can then even summon more. Um, if your ally is taking some pretty brutal hits, uh, then they can also end up backing out. And then these things will then in turn on the skeleton. And this is uh, I'm mostly a Euro game player, like I said. So the generating summons um, and not having them expended immediately is building a system for you to be cashing in on your resources, which are the skeletons constantly attacking throughout the course of the round. So this kind of um, go slow, someone, someone, hide behind your allies to summon skeletons so that the skeletons can kind of jump around them. I really like this summoning a skeleton right behind my friend so that the skeleton in the subsequent turn, any, any enemies that are coming maybe from off map or in a bigger map um, that are running towards your ally, next turn really easily in reach of your two move skeletons. Um, and then the more you have, the more they can kind of just trundle in the way. And then your tank friend gets to kind of decide when they're tapping out um, and the skeletons can kind of take the final hits of the combat um, in whatever this scenario is. You know, your tank friend can say, well, you know, I'm going to hit and then move and then maybe I'm long resting next turn. It's like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. I got a couple speed bumps in the way um, who can take the hits for you in the meanwhile. So that's just kind of some general thoughts about uh, uh, summoning your your minions here when you're playing the bone shaper um the other thing i found in two player especially is that the the bone shaper has a couple healing ally cards uh the these i think are intended to be like oh you're healing your minions and and you can do that um, but i often found that just have playing with a tank friend and healing them is is sort of the more efficient uh thing to do because then they are taking hits for your skeletons rather than them maybe getting destroyed and then you may be keeping them alive. Three hit points is just a volatile enough amount of hit points that even at first level, a monster can just essentially end up one-shotting your skeletons, kind of depending on the situation. So keeping them healed up is, is more or less useless, um, I think, most of the time. You just kind of want them to have their damage and, and trundle along with their lives um, as it as it goes. Um, this does get a little bit trickier. I, I have not personally played the Bone Shaper without a tank friend. Well, that's not true. My, my partner did play a spoiled, uh, like a, a hidden class, so I won't talk about what class it was, but was not a tank class, more of a controlling class, battlefield control class. And it was a little bit tougher um, that I did end up using the, the undead more as um, speed bumps in those situations. Uh, even still, just being very cognizant of what your enemies can do. Hounds are terrible, terrible matchup for you. Um, so this is maybe a bad example, but like knowing that hounds can move a lot of spaces means that, you know, my whole general plan of like hang back some some skeletons and let them move forward is gonna not work so well against these guys. But if I was fighting against some Algox guards and the room was a little bit bigger, then me and my partner can kind of just plan to go slow and they can trundle their way towards us and I'll summon a bunch of skeletons in front of them, um, which we can then kind of start duking out from there. So uh, that's that's kind of the initial go of, of just what I think some movement situations look like uh, in Frosthaven. Let's dive into talking a little bit more about the Bone Shaper in particular. All right, let's start with the general advice on this card. So first of all, you have garbage hit points. Uh, you are a caster type, you know, hit point track in uh, in Frosthaven. And um, unfortunately, uh, this this scaling is, is, a, is a big problem for you. You really need hit points and health as this character. A lot of your abilities do this thing where you do two damage to yourself in order to play the card. And I found myself very often plummeting down to one, two, or three hit points. Um, having an ally that can throw some healing your way is immensely helpful. So if you have friends that that are are able to heal or do some incidental heals or um, you know can heal the party a point or two, um, it's something to, to really, really keep in mind uh, and and advocate for if you're if your partners are saying, hey, should I you know be taking some healing with you? 
healing is better for the bone shaper and it's better in frost haven i would say in general than it ever was in gloom haven um which i think is cool i think it's a really neat part of this class uh you are a backline character if you take hits as this character you just don't have the health to do that because you're going to be paying your health to be doing your abilities if you are not paying your health to do your abilities you are just a very not impactful character i think in the game um so not taking hits is really really important for this character you can take a few here and there don't get me wrong and the reason that you can take a few here and there 12 cards this is absolutely insane this character has the greatest longevity of any character i have ever played in this game um, that is because you have 12 cards and basically very, very few of them are losses. Uh, you know, even like permanent loss cards that you put into play or anything like that. You are going to be playing this character, I think, most of the time where you're just kind of running the cards. I ended scenarios regularly with a six or seven card hand easily. Um, just lots and lots of time and flexibility uh, before the end of the scenario. So you can take hits, but you'll be, and, and you can pitch cards to hits, um, but it's something that you need to be aware of. This is a character where actually pitching cards for hits, when you take a three or four damage hit, depending on your kind of hit point status and what you're planning on doing over the next few rounds, you might want to lose a card. Uh, that's not normal, I think, for most characters. You kind of will wait to lose a card until you are in a situation where you're just about to die or the hit was you know critical that did six or more damage or whatever um, bone shaper is a character where it is a very very real resource to use your cards as your hit points because your hit points are more you have very very few hit points that you need and very very many cards of which you don't need all of um, there were i don't think i ever exhausted in a scenario from anything other than being overwhelmed and like beat to death right um it's helpful to have a friend who tanks for, for, for doing that. Okay, so this advice about, you know, watching your hit points is is extremely accurate. On the back here, a couple things that I want to comment on. So the, the back here lists this character as really high on defense. I think that's because of the concept of, of roadblocks. Um, that is fair enough to me. I would not rate this quite white so high on defense and a little bit higher on support uh, but that might have just been the way that i chose to play this character myself um melee i'm curious i mean this character itself has no melee really what you have is a swarm of people that are hitting for attack twos um and that is your melee damage and the the difference between having one skeleton or zero skeletons in play and your impact on the battlefield and three skeletons in play, your impact in, in battlefield is massive. I mean, it's triple, right? Like it re really is a huge, huge difference. Every one of your skeletons is essentially a character every turn who's playing a base move to attack to. That's, that is a kind of a way to think about your skeletons is they are using their character that does no special abilities whatsoever. Um, and attacking with three of them, the damage adds up really, really quickly. So the melee rating here is, is a curious one. Ranged, this character sucks at ranged. You have a couple uh, ranged attacks, but I think this is even lower than the list. They are correct that your mobility is very bad on this character. I end up using a lot of base move twos in the bottom just because there's not a lot of exciting stuff that I'm doing with my bottom actions. Um, and I like picking up loot. Uh, so that's that's something to be concerned about. And then control depends on your definition of control. You're not really good at putting stat ability modifiers on other creatures um, or anything like that. Or really, I guess, controlling the battlefield in any way other than creating skeletons that get in the way and distract the monsters. So that's, this, that's a kind of sense of control. But maybe that's kind of what they're calling more defense here. I do want to comment on the elemental affinities. Having two elemental affinities that are um, night and uh, uh, green nature, grass, whatever you want to call it, um, is pretty cool. That's that's not common, I think, for a lot of characters uh, in Frosthaven. I've not played this character with the other um, starting class that uses night, the, um, the Deathwalker. Uh, I think that would really change some aspects of this character because one thing I will say is that I really struggled to generate as many resources as I wanted to use. 
Um, it did happen, you know, I, I, I paid attention to the, the flows of those things sometimes, but the way that I was playing this class, which was very summoning focused, I struggled with getting the elementals that I needed. And so being in certain scenarios where there were night demons and stuff like that, I was actually quite excited because it gave me opportunity to, to soup up my cards in a way that I wasn't often doing. Let's talk about what I would call the bread and butter of this class. Um, uh, this is, this is your summoning kit at first level. Uh, you got 15 cards that we're looking at at first level, and these four cards form the fundamental basis of your kit. Um, first of all, before I dive into talking about skeletons, I highly recommend naming your skeletons, either naming them by card um, or naming them by number. Uh, it just adds a lot of fun and a lot of personality that I really enjoyed, so give it a shot. Uh, but let's dive into each of these cards Mostly what most of these cards are is the same, right? The, the, these skeleton cards are the same. I'll come back to Angry Spirits in a minute, but I did think it deserved a place here. Um, this card, Damned Horde, the bottom of this, I thought when I started, I was like, curse two people within range two. That's amazing. You know, I'm going to be standing there and watching my skeletons kill people a lot of the time. So I'm going to be using this and... It's okay. Uh, it is not as good or as impactful as I often thought. Uh, a lot of times when I started playing this character, these two cards were my starting cards, and I intentionally went at 91, the slower initiative, to do that summoning thing I was talking about. And I would summon someone, and then I would use the bottom to curse someone else. And that's a totally respectable start. Um, but then I found myself sometimes, depending on, we'll get back to this with the other cards, wanting to keep this card so that I could summon more skeletons in the future because I really enjoyed having a pile of skeletons um, around to, to ramp up that damage output that I was doing. Um, the This card, Life and Death here, is my favorite card to use on the first turn. I'm probably not playing that, that bottom ability of the next three sources to negate the damage right at the beginning of the game. It's totally respectable to do so and kind of like manage your health really early, especially if the um, enemies are right on you or you're worried about a bunch of archers kind of picking you off at the beginning of the game because you just you have to manage your hit points so much um, but I generally am very very anti-losing cards uh, which is maybe part of the reason why I played this character to extreme uh, longevity so um, I, I generally use the top of that card to do that. The other thing is that this card, Return Servant, its bottom is a move four and of your 15 cards only three of them uh, give you the ability to move three or four spaces. And so I actually wound up using this card for its bottom more than any of the other three cards for their bottoms throughout the course of the game. It's not that you need to move a lot with this character. You really can kind of summon, trundle forward, pick up loot, but there are plenty of scenarios, and Frosthaven especially, where movement is a significant component of what it is that you're doing or where it is that you need to be going. You also just can't fall too far behind your allies. Um, something that I didn't talk about, which we'll, we'll let's come back to it right now, is if you um, are trying to cross a room and let's say you've cleared all the enemies, and I don't have a door tile, but let's say that there's a door tile up in the corner over here. It's pretty important for you actually to spend your turn running up into the corner or up into the corner and summoning a skeleton um, ahead of your friend. Your friend can then go and open the door, ideally for you, and then um, you can then move in afterwards. Since we're talking about this, let's actually add one extra thing about this. Ideally, this situation is the end of a given round. Then on the next round, when we go, I'm going to go really late again, have my friend go first, and then they'll go charging into the room, opening the door. The reason that I care about this is that the AI on my skeletons will not move towards that door unless there's an enemy through there. So having your friend open the door so your skeleton says, oh, there's something to go fight in there um, is, is a really significant component of initiative order and initiative management with this character. So another reason why you want to intentionally go late. I um, mean, you'll notice as we're going through the cards that the Bone Shapers initiative cards are horrible. So generally you are going to be going late all the time, which just fits in nicely with your game plan anyway. So you're kind of set up to, to succeed already in that fashion. Um, but making sure that your, your friends are breaching the door is usually a benefit to you. Uh, also, if you're a Gloomhaven player, do not miss the fact that they added a new rule into the game that if a um, summon has nothing to focus on on the board, you can have them focus on you and move closer to you, which can be very beneficial. So I also, you know, if I had a, we just finished kind of killing a guy, um, 
Ideally, what I'd like to do is run over here and then maybe like long rest or something like that while the skeleton makes its way up to me, my friend's long resting as well, and then on the subsequent turn, they break into the door, or even if I go before them, they're at least closing the gap here, so you don't completely leave your undead in the dust. Okay, that's some general summoning strategy for y'all. Um, every single one of these skeletons does that two damage to yourself thing, so just be aware of that. This character uh, easily rolls in experience points because summoning is the most fun thing that you can do as this character. You're rewarded very very handily for for doing that um repeatedly so i've talked a little bit about each of these skeleton cards um again th these are your bread and butter i think getting getting uh three into play is really difficult but awesome getting two into play i think is pretty important uh getting one into play on the first turn and then dropping the second one one of them is going to get deleted at one point in time but having two in play allows you to essentially always have an undead that is active because probably one of them is going to get knocked down and then when you have two of them attacking you see really how your damage can ramp up pretty quickly over time having three is a little bit excessive it depends on the scenario um, and what it is that you're doing it, it could be really hard to manage three um, in terms of space we were playing two players so space was not so much of an issue for us i imagine playing this at four player putting three skeletons into play is just a non-starter because they just wouldn't have places to go they end up getting in each other's way and so when there's just one or two more more allies in play i imagine it would just be so much harder still um so you know if you're playing with more players suspect that you're not going to be putting three three guys into play one person that you can put into play though is uh lady banshee here i guess she's a wraith i always called her a banshee um she is a summon that looks pretty weak to start off with and I think actually does a lot more work than folks think. So she's only got one hit point, which means she can get eliminated. This is a loss card, which is different from your other summons, which are repeatable. Let me come back to this, actually, because that's a really significant point. These cards are not loss cards. They're not loss summons. So a couple of things that are important about thinking about your skeletons is that when you go to rest, if you want to, you can crumble one of these skeletons and take the card back into your hand. Now, when you want to do that is just a question of like, are your skeletons in an effective place? Are they going to be able to get somewhere to go? And also, is putting this card back into my hand reshuffle going to give me an even number of cards going into the next round because if for instance let's say i start with 12 cards i have all three skeletons in play that puts me down to nine cards and then i lose a card on a rest puts me down to eight cards well eight cards is going to be four rounds of actions so that's actually pretty respectable but if i had two in play well this puts me to nine cards which is a little bit awkward so crumbling one of them actually gives me five rounds of actions before i need to rest so if one of them is in a kind of suspicious place it's a totally valid choice to just be like eh you're dead winston i'm done with you um if they're hurt if they're just not in the right position where they need to be in um, it can be worth getting rid of them that being said it's another action and another two health to resummon them so do not be too liberal with crumbling your skeletons but it is great for card management that you can do so at any time banshee wraith uh she can't unfortunately right she's a lost card you're going to use her once and she's going to kind of trundle along she moves at the same speed as the skeletons but she has a crazy range um and she's got two shields so it's unlikely she's going to get clipped by a random monster but one person with a decent hit on her if she's just kind of like out in the out in the world um can end up killing her i'll come back to like why she's more impactful later but she just adds a little bit of extra damage and that is what your character does is lots of little incremental damage that adds up over time i played this card a lot in my first run throughs and was really impressed by it um, because of another card that i'll talk about later in my later run-throughs, and depending on the enemies that I fought, I actually ended up using the bottom of this card a fair amount. On the next death, one of your thumbs um, due to damage from an attack, the attacker suffers two damage. This was a way that I could deal with um, flame demons and things like that that have lots of shields but very, very few hit points. Um, having a way to drop two damage at them with kind of like suicide skeletons was a nice way of dealing with multiple different kinds of enemies at the same time. This is a lot of work, like a skeleton and this card is a lot of work and some of your own health to do two damage to an enemy. But the fact that this is an ability that you can consider throwing into play once your skeletons have already done some work, actually quite advantageous. So don't sleep on the bottom of this card. It's pretty nice. All right, let's talk about 
malicious conversion. It deserves just its own conversation. So remember how I said often at the beginning I was playing these two cards and then this card would go into play and then this card would go into the discard pile. If you are looking for a pretty explosive start, malicious conversion is the card that does that. So this is what you're gonna do in a room that's like a lot of bad guys are in the way at the beginning um, and you're, you're worried about getting swarmed by the enemies, right? Um, usually when you're getting swarmed by enemies, you're also fighting enemies with fewer hit points. So you can use this card to kill someone and then summon someone from your discard pile. Well, nice thing that I used this card in the previous round for not its summoning part, and you don't lose the two health for doing so. This can be a really, really big game changer. And like I said, I'm generally a person who doesn't like using lost cards, especially in the first what I'll call lap, which is before you rest for the first time. But if there's a character that can afford to lose cards, it is this character. You have 12. You can make use of them. This gets you off the off the uh, starting block really quickly. Um, so don't sleep on this card. It's just really, really nice value. It does a fair amount of work for you. And generating these icons, like I said, I struggled to, to generate icons. Um, the other thing is that the bottom of this card is fine for us. Uh, this move three is more than we're going to be moving most turns of this game. And if you can make it a move five, that's even better. Um, so it's it's worth putting this card in your deck uh, for that, that reason. The other reason that you put this card in your deck is that, like I said, most of your initiative cards are garbage. These two cards, actually these three cards, with the exception of one that I'll talk about later, are some of your best initiative cards in your stack. 18, I think, is your actual best initiative card in your starting stack. Um, so this card being a an early mover, we talked earlier about that strategy of like summon late, act early. These are the cards that let you do that. There are some enemies that you're not going to beat. You're not going to go faster than most flame demons. You're not going to go faster than most hounds. Um, however, there are most enemies that you're going to beat with an 18, a 26, or even a 30, um, which allows your skeletons to get in there and get some hits before they themselves get popped, which is really, really valuable. Um, Flow of the Black River is, I think, a pretty unassuming looking card. Uh, the most significant comp part of this card is that it's an initiative 18. You have no other options for low initiative at this level, um, except for one that I'll talk about later. And it just, it does the work for that reason. Um, I've talked about how much health management is, uh, is significant in this game. X plus one, where X is the number of your summons, is not that many. Um, if I've summoned two skeletons and my Banshee, which is three, that's probably the most summons you're ever going to have in play. That's a heal for self, which is like good-ish. Um, a heal four is like a respectable top ability, but it's not something that you're usually super juiced about. Um, that being said, you are at a point where you've put all these summons into play, where you're at one or two hit points. You desperately need this healing. So I quite like this card um, for for that. I try not to use it when uh, I've got fewer than three in play because healing for one or two is just like a little bit of a bummer. Um, but I have done it in an emergency. I also thought that this bottom grant one of your summons move to uh, was going to be more important than than it actually ended up being. I ended up using this card for its top more than its bottom because usually my summons, I just had summoned them into places where they would then trundle, you know, forwards um, successfully. So uh, I found that the bottom of this I actually didn't need quite as much. Fell Remedy, low key in a two player party, was one of my best cards. Um, like I said, my primary strategy when I was playing this was to have my ally tank for me, summon skeletons, and now we have a lot of damage output. Uh, but that meant that my ally was often quite low on hit points. Hitting someone with a heal six after a malicious conversion or even just a heal four, maybe getting some um, uh, uh, experience along the way is pretty big game. If you can get all that stuff assembled together, I quite like the top of this card. I think that it's really, really helpful if you're using the strategy that I'm suggesting about having an ally take hits for your skeleton so you can get up a kind of damage machine army um, and get them on the way. Um, you'll also look at the bottom of this card and I've talked about how much you need healing with this card. I'll say one thing that's a little bit awkward with this card, at least in my experience, one healing for yourself in the bottom is like fine. Having two, if an enemy died this turn is much nicer. It's doubly as good. Um, usually when you're playing this card, you're going at initiative 30. So it can vary based on who your ally is, whether they've had an opportunity to, to get someone else. Um, hopefully you, one of your skeletons has managed to finish something off. So 
having a sense of where the enemy's hit points are at and if your skeletons are likely to knock someone down can double the effectiveness of using the bottom of this card. That being said, I ended up using the top a lot because of the aforementioned, my friend takes most of the hits for me. But if you're the kind of person who is having... Um, like repeatedly summoning uh you might not need to use the top of that and you might need to get that healing the other way okay um we were just talking about healing so i also want to talk about this card which i think is a low-key amazing card in your in your starting set here i used this bottom ability never when i started the game because i was like five healing to them two damage to myself i'm always hurting myself why would i be doing that well the reason i would be doing that is because my friend is tanking all my hits for me five healing as a bottom action is actually quite impactful. And I said, I struggled at making elements. This makes an element. So if I have the health to spare, I'm not worried that I'm gonna get clipped by a random bad guy at this point in time, because I've got a bunch of skeletons that are in the way. I've got my friend that's in the way. Um, so I'm not gonna get shot at by some random bad guy unless I'm fighting one of these guys that has you know three targets or whatever. And even in that case, I'm probably not the priority target because there's a lot of summons that I have that are gonna be the priority targets for that. Um, this bottom ability, really surprised me in its value. So something to consider. I use this top ability quite a lot at the beginning of the game. Um, throwing poison on things is so good with the bone shaper. Poison is sort of like a sub theme of your cards. And I was talking about like, if you have two skeletons, that's, you know, two attack twos, that's really nice. This suddenly makes them attack threes, essentially. It's a 50% increase in impact for every one of your skeletons. It doubles the impact of your um your banshee and i just i just can't rant enough about how good poison is for beating down people um because you're just going to be hit. you do you do lots of small hits poison is better on this class than i think almost any other class i've ever seen um i don't know that i would use my elements for these abilities like i liked the elements a lot more for doing a big heal six but being able to target some additional allies with strengthen some additional um enemies with poison is nice game as an option for this card so it's kind of a weird card uh but don't sleep on it it's something that's really nice to use i would say in like your mid rounds you've kind of done your summoning cycle you've got a few folks in play you want to impact the the, the game state somehow um, and if you want to impact the game state somehow and you finish your summoning, this is one of those primary ways you're going to do that at the beginning. It's a ranged attack. It does slightly more damage if you have a summon next to it, makes some poison. I've already talked about how poison works um, and how, how amazing poison is. Um, this is what I was talking about with the Wraith earlier. Um, poison just makes her so much better at low levels. You can really, really pile on the damage. And it makes a green, which you might need for doing some healing next turn or some additional movements next turn, right? You saw that card that, that can use a green to make you move five instead of move three. A couple options here. Um, this bottom ability here for people that are, are players from Frosthaven might be very exciting to you. All of your summon attacks are unaffected by retaliate. Uh, I was using hounds in the example earlier. Horrible monster for your skeletons to be fighting because they take one retaliate damage every time they attack. Um, Frost demons are even worse that two damage on retaliates i ended up using this ability less than i was going to if you're coming out of frost haven you're like oh man some of their classes are really weak that in my guys they just trundle into into retaliates that was my instinct as well i thought that the bottom of this card was going to be really really impactful and don't get me wrong when you look at the monster stat in in a certain scenario yep like this is going to be um the card that goes that way i found myself using my bottom actions a fair amount to do a little incidental healing to kind of like do little negative things to people to do the small amount of movement that I was doing over the course of the game putting effects into play and uh this is demanding to put into play at, at some point and it's a loss card um I often found ways to get around the retaliate issue in other senses so one thing is that like my skeletons fighting hounds who at the levels that I, we were playing at have retaliate one well skeletons have three hit points most monsters kind of end up one-shotting them anyway the hounds if they're using their pack tactics they're doing an attack four so if you have a damage on your skeleton like it doesn't matter that much um, they're not going to attack enough times that the retaliate is going to stack up and be the reason that they die so i i found that actually 
I did not need this as, as much as I really thought. Um, it is helpful. You should take it into scenarios where retaliate is. But if you can have an ally just kind of take them out, if you're playing with a ranged character, which we weren't, uh, then that, that can really make a big impact on, on what it is that you're you're doing with their your um with your skeletons but consider this card i i would i took this card for a bunch of my first scenarios and then this was a card that once i started leveling up i ended up cutting um all right now we're on to uh kind of the the more like undead support cards so all six of these are my undead support cards. And you can't take all of these. Um, first of all, I haven't explicitly mentioned this, but you know, like I said, this card I ended up cutting after I leveled up, but I had low levels for a while. This card I had, I ended up cutting after I leveled up for a bit and I got some more healing, but I used this quite a bit at the beginning. I never cut this card. I never cut this card, although I, I could see cutting it certainly at higher levels because it starts to, to drop off even, even more than it already has and you get some other initiative options. This card's just neat. I think it is it is very cuttable. I cut it in lots of instances where I didn't need an explosive start. These cards are not cuttable. You, I, I think you just don't... You don't not take your skeletons with you to the show. Um, that being said, I've in there listed maybe two or three cuts. Um... We need to cut some of these in in our stack, uh, so so I'll go through um, those and and you choose what you want. And I'm a really really big proponent of choosing different cards for different scenarios. So take what I say here with a grain of salt. I'm not going to tell you exactly what 12 cards to bring with you into your first scenario. I don't think that that is helpful or impactful. Uh, but I'll tell you a card that I never played with once, and it is Exploding Corpse. Um, love the theme of this. I played a lot of Diablo back in the day. Exploding one of my skeletons seemed really, really exciting. It's a lot of damage. Four to all enemies adjacent to the designated summon. However, your summons are dumb, and they just kind of walk up to the first enemy they see. It is not common that they are surrounded by enemies. If they are surrounded by enemies, they've probably been killed. If you put them into the middle of, of, of enemies, it's because you used a bottom action to force them into there. So I think this card requires a lot more setup then it kind of seems like on the surface. The fire generation is useless for all of your friends at first level. There's no character that uses fire generation in the starting um, Frosthaven kit. Uh, if there's another person that maybe uses fire in your party, maybe it's a little bit more exciting. Um, but I just think that the cost of this card is not that great. That being said, it's a really low initiative, which is super exciting. And the bottom of this card is not so bad. When the next enemy dies this round, all allies and enemies adjacent to the hex in which it died suffer too. That seems, on the surface, really good. And I think this card is much better at four players, because at four players, if I go first at 21, my skeletons do some damage, and then I've got all of my allies to go after me to do something. At two players, this card doesn't do a lot because my skeletons may or may not take someone down, but they go before I do. So what my skeletons kill people, that corpse isn't going to explode. So I need my one ally to go later than me in the turn and then successfully kill something that it's possible my skeletons killed themselves if they got lucky or unlucky or, you know, whatever. Like if it's it, There's a lot of variability with like the combat math when it comes to your skeletons because you're just drawing from your deck. And if you started this game, your skeletons could do anywhere from zero to four damage, like pretty even distributionally um, based on that, that, that you're starting combat deck. So I found this card to not be that, that helpful, uh, but it's hilarious. So I'll say that. Um, all right, then we are on to the grant one of your summons. Well, let's put those later. Let's talk about Approach Oblivion, which is a card I did not play very much. Um, the top ability here is a low range bless heal damage yourself thing we play a two-player game i could see a scenario where i have a couple skeletons i'm playing a four-player game and this can just generate tons and tons and tons of healing and the two-player game there was almost no circumstance where i wanted to play this card do two damage to myself to heal my ally for four and then like maybe a skeleton and then I would get a bless and a curse and my ally would get a bless. It just doesn't do enough work at two players that I ever play the top of this card. Um, maybe at four players, like I said. The bottom of this ability, grant one of your summons three move, is a little bit more interesting 
Um, that is something that I think is more valuable depending on the card you take at level two. I did not find that I ever needed this. I never took this card with me and I never really regretted not having it, uh, except for maybe the level two card that we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, it makes wind, which is mostly useless for I think all of the starting characters. So this card was a pretty quick cut for me. I never really took it with me. All right. Now we are on to your minion support cards that are make your minions attack. Um, these are really interesting more because of their bottom actions than their top actions. Uh, but let's go through each of them. So Dark Tidings on the top here is if you've managed to get three summons on the battlefield, you can make them all attack. If you have a knight, you can make them do poison, which we've already talked about how great that is. You can pile on the curse. This card seems terrifying. And I have... I don't think ever across like 20 scenarios managed to trigger it to its maximum capacity. It is just so hard to have three minions still alive by the time it comes to your turn. They already attacked at the beginning of your turn. They might have killed the thing that was in front of them, which means they might not be in range to attack certain enemies. Yes, this is when you can use the cards that, that say, you know, the move minions two spaces that I, I haven't used very much. Um, but it's a lot of setup. You also need to like have the the knight for this card. It it is a big payoff. It's a lot of setup to do this though. Uh, I think this is probably best maybe against certain kinds of bosses. But a lot of the bosses that we ended up fighting, which I think we only fought one maybe two, uh, ended up killing my skeletons really really quickly, faster than I could summon them. That being said, I took dark tidings into almost every other scenario. Why is that? It's because the move four. This is the primary reason that I ended up using this card. And then if you're able to cash in on the top of this card, it's great. I would recommend taking this card with you for quite some time, um, though it is cuttable later on. Command the Wretched is one of my favorite cards. Um, it looks pretty weak at the beginning, honestly. I was not impressed by the text uh, stat block on this card. But more so than the retaliate issue, you have a shield issue. You suck at dealing with enemies with shields. Um Playing with the, the Drifter as my as my friend was very helpful, not only because the Drifter was tanking, but because the Drifter also had the capability of making, you know, attack fives or something like that to break through enemy shields. Woof, if you, 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 you really need allies to help you deal with enemies with shields. You suck at fighting enemies with shields. There's just no two ways about it. This lets you breach that a little bit by having one ally have a pierce two. So if you have a slightly bigger... But, you know, bigger guy to go, or even just throwing this on a skeleton, like makes it so that you are chipping away at enemies that you normally could not affect. Um, also, it comes with a move at the top, so you you have the flexibility to to do what you want to do. Um, the bottom of this card is also a really nice loss card for granting it's one ally, so that's any of your undead or any of the other players at the table. Um, that's really easy to trigger. Five is a is a big big hit. Uh, so this is a nice thing to just kind of like cash in at the end of the game and, and push towards that 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 final moment. I quite like Command the Wretched. Wrath of the Turned Earth is the same as that other card that I talked about. It's granting uh, uh, your summons attacks, but it's only one summon, and they can't move before that attack, so they had to have not killed the thing that they were already fighting. Um, if you have green and they put poison on them, it's nice. It's but it's just it's just okay. Uh, you know, this is this card basically reads attack three next to a specific thing that's in a specific place, and then if you have green, it's a little bit better. It's fine. The bottom of this card is more relevant if you are playing the single monster build, which we'll talk when we level up. Um, that's that's all fun and good, but uh, it's not so relevant, I think, for your skeletons that much. Um, that being said, walk into a final room. Throw this down, have your skeletons trundle forward, have them be immune to you know a couple hits is going to make it so that you're going to push your way to the finish line. So if you manage to keep this card with you until I think the final room, it's a really nice time to kind of like turn this on and then just say like, yeah, we're going to go the rest of the way. But you need to get there. You need to have the skeletons in play already to do it or you know be summoning them along with this card. Um, it's, it's more set up than I thought it was going to be. It is powerful when you get it to work. I just think that it doesn't work as often as you want it to. And then this one right here, um, first of all, cursing someone five spaces away uh, is a fine little ability. Uh, mostly what it does is it lets your ally attack, but it does generate a knight, which, you know, as I mentioned, I found that generation of the, um, 
the appropriate resources uh, elements to be a little bit tricky. Um, having your skeletons uh, loot things see is first of all hilarious. Um, but I will say that more often than not, a skeleton is next to like one loot pile, at least in my experience, just because of the way they move, they're stupid and they don't get into the mix of things. And so this is one of the weakest loot ones that exists in the Haven universe because you can't control where you are and it's not like a pile of bodies are surrounding your puny little skeletons. Um, usually they are trundling forward and, and getting bad guys as, as they get there. Maybe this is a little bit better in four player where the board is just a little bit more cluttered with, with loot tiles. Um, but I found that just me doing a move to and, and walking onto a, a loot card was generally as good itself. So this card ended up being a cut fair amount of time. So you'll notice that I, I talked about these like command minion cards and, and a lot of them were on my list of cuts. I just like having minions. I don't need to tell them to do something else. So having minions and keeping them alive to me was a greater priority than having the minions be efficient um, in their actions. Uh, again, that's just my experience, but that's how I'd recommend playing it. Cool. Let's dive into a couple level ups. Um, I won't go, I mean, I can talk about the higher level ones and I'm going to, but um, I'll tell you that I took this character to level six i got to level six as this character and i only played level six for for a little bit i think most people that are going to be playing this game are going to be playing bone shaper at first level and then retiring by roughly the time that i did so frankly your experience is going to largely mirror mine <laughs> all right here are your two level two cards the card on the left six hit points and hitting for three this is just kind of like a big boy skeleton i mentioned like kind of single single um guy builds and, and one of the masteries that you have is about summoning someone on the first turn and then having them live through the whole scenario if you want to accomplish a mastery as this class that's probably the easier one to do and you could probably do it at this low level um i think this bottom ability is fine you know you need your your enemies to your minions have moved up they've attacked they've not killed the thing that they've attacked so you're putting on a poison kind of after they've taken their turn it's okay I just think it doesn't trigger quite so often. So my skepticism about this card meant that I took Bone Dagger, which I can speak more to. Um, I took Bone Dagger because I wanted to go kind of like Skeleton Swarmy build. That was a thing that appealed to me. And if you look at the bottom here, cursing someone, and then if they die, I get to do that like malicious, um, the same as that, that malicious card that when kills someone, I can take a skeleton from my discard pile, put it into play and not take the, uh, the damage for it. I wound up using this card like one or two times ever. It is tough for you to be in a situation where you are two spaces away from an enemy. They didn't get killed by your skeleton, so your, one of your allies needs to kill them this turn. This is a card that's probably better in four-player than it is in two-player. The bottom of this, which is the reason I took this card, mm -mm, did not end up cashing out for me. That being said, the top of this card is an attack five, six, seven. Um, depending on, on kind of how you're set up, which I used in plenty of scenarios to, to decent effect. In retrospect, I might have gone back and had this big boy to summon. That being said, I don't think this character's level two cards are that exciting. Um, either of these is fine. I don't think you can go wrong with either. I don't, it's just a, a question of what it is that you want to do. Third level is very exciting though. So first of all, both of these are great for skeleton builds, uh, people who like summoning lots and lots of skeletons. So first of all, this guy on the left summons another skeleton, but I do want to point out that it's one health instead of two. That seems like not a big deal. It's a big deal. Your hit points are a huge, huge management resource. Um, this really, really makes a difference. The bottom of this card is bananas. You can do a damage to yourself to play a card from your discard pile, but then you'd have to pay the health of that card. So you can just go crazy on how many skeletons you summon in a turn. Um, or kind of resummon, but you need to have a lot of health to make that work. I think the bottom of this card probably mostly only works if you have someone in your party who is giving you additional health or if you have a healing potion or something like that. Mostly though, you'll probably be using the top of this, which is nice. I however went with this card because it seemed really fun. Um, the top is that bomb exploding ability, same kind of thing. Um, however, it's not a loss card, which is nice, and it comes with some poison, so that's beneficial. I almost never used the top dough because I loved the idea of this bottom ability. Um, when you're 
when your minions are getting attacked, which is, you know, all the time, um, that enemy gains a poison, or if they're already poisoned, they take damage. This is true for you as well, which is really, really neat. And just the idea of constantly punishing enemies for attacking you, um, this is true at range, so it's better than a retaliate. I thought it was really, really impactful. Um, so I ended up taking this card and I was not disappointed with it ever. Um, really, really cool for, for summoning skeletons and constantly punishing enemies. Uh, but that other level three card, if you just want to like swarm skeletons, I think is totally legitimate. Level four here, um, critical failure, which is a card I did not take, allows you to make one of your summons attack. You'll notice that I... Uh, ha this has the same problem that I've mentioned with the other ones is that your minion doesn't move so it just needs to be in the right situation um, that was one of the reasons why I didn't end up taking this card and then the bottom of this card um, if a curse causes an enemy to deal no damage all your summons adjacent to that enemy get to attack that enemy to me that seems like a really specific list of things to do I found that I was giving the monster deck a couple curses uh, but I wasn't not anything like the curse levels that people could f pull off in Gloomhaven. You know, I'd throw in maybe three or four in a good scenario. Um, if you have allies that are making curses, maybe this card's a little bit more viable. This just seemed kind of niche for it to work for me. So instead, I went with this one because, like I said, my ally was always tanking. And so giving my ally additional shield and retaliate seemed good. The real reason I took this card is because I needed that low initiative. I, I wanted another option for being able to go really fast. Um, and then the other thing is I actually low-key really liked this ability on the bottom, taking two damage myself if I was in a pretty decent health spot to keep a skeleton alive for a round was a totally worthwhile trade. This is like preemptively summoning a skeleton uh, because I'm preventing one of my skeletons from dying. And he's already in play where I want him to be. Um... I found the bottom of this to actually be much better than I thought I was going to. I, was, I thought I was going to be playing the top of this all the time, but because I didn't have the appropriate resources a lot of the time, I ended up actually playing the bottom of this, and it was was quite good. The other thing is that this is really nice is if you took the, the big boy at level 2, you can save him, or you can save this big boy at level 5. Because I had regrets about not taking the big boy at level 2, I ended up taking this card. Um, because he just got a lot of hit points and he throws some wounds on bad guys, which seemed fun to me. Uh, but also the bottom here, a three or four heal that I could use on myself as well as allies seemed really, really good. Um, so I took this card and do not regret it. It was very, very powerful. Um, I will say that Solid Bones is pretty exciting, though. Having all skeletons be buffed with a pierce and an extra health is pretty nice. Um, the difference between four and three health is very real. It means that the, I think the odds of getting one-shotted, just they just go down significantly. Um, even when you are at level five, I think the monsters are, you know, probably level three-ish at this point if, you're, if your allies are the same. Four is, a, you know, it's a teeter-totter amount of damage. I think a lot of monsters do do four points of damage. So it's not always going to work out in your favor. Of course, this bottom move is nice, but I think that if you're taking this card, it is because you're putting this into play, you're putting it into play probably pretty early. So the bottom move here, I think, is probably not the main reason that you end up taking this card, but it is strictly an upgrade of your other moves because it also makes a green, and we've already talked about how generation is tough. All right. This card's hilarious, just hilarious. First of all, you take six damage, it goes at 66. I see you, Isaac. Um, yeah, this is just summoning piles of skeletons if you have the health. That is a lot of health to pay. Uh, I think if you took the, the the skeleton card in the previous round, the one that uh, makes all your skeletons tougher, then this might be the card that I would end up taking here. Um, I ended up just taking the other card as a, as a role player. Uh, oh, this this bottom one, by the way, is uh, move and move one of your summons, or maybe move and move one of your summons, which you already kind of know how I feel about. I think if you're taking this card, you're you're really considering the top um, of this primarily. Top of this card's totally fine. Making your people move a little bit faster, doing an attack, it's a totally fine role player. Make some knight along the way, and then you can use the bottom to poison someone or and curse someone. Having a bottom attack ability is nice because there's just a lot of turns where you're not moving. So I took this card and it was completely respectable, but I think these are back to being more role player cards than anything else. Beyond this point, I retired my character. So we are just speculating uh, based on my experiences of these cards at this point. 
Um, soul claim. Uh, this allows you to throw in extra curses into into the the deck of the enemy. This is this card sticks around and it goes back into your deck. So if for some reason you are very excited by cursing um, and cursing strategies, this card becomes really good. I think cursing is generally better at four players than it is at two players. Generally, monsters are making more attacks, so your odds of drawing those curses out of the deck is a little bit higher than they are at two players. So I've never really been into cursing strategies myself. Um, but it also generates a knight. This card seems totally fine to me. It's uh, very respectable to put this up, you know, after you've kind of like summoned your skeletons. Um, but it's it doesn't draw me immediately. I'm not that drawn to this card. The bottom part says the next monster dies, immediately play a card from your discard pile, reducing any damage you suffer by two. And um, so this is another one of these summon cards. Uh, it's a lot better than the level two one because it doesn't have a range associated with it. But as I've mentioned before, you really need allies who are going after you in the round. And it's nice that this has an earlier initiative because if your skeletons kill things too late, you can't do this with your skeletons having already done those things. So I am drawn instead to recycled limbs, which uh, the top of this card seems very, very hard to, to pull off. Um, but it's nice if you can, right? Like if you play your malicious intent or whatever that makes both of those icons or the somehow you just end up having both of them, getting a free ability at the top as well as granting all of your summons a move and attack is big, big, big game. I mean, that's why this is a lost card. Uh, so I, I quite see the power of the top of this and the power of a lost card that's gonna you're gonna cash in probably later on. You want to make sure the other side is good, and I do think the other side of this is good. Next three deaths of any figure, so that could be your skeletons, that could be um, the enemies. I mean, there's just a lot of people that can die. Heal two, so ultimately this is a heal six card. It's gonna last until you know you either choose to cash it out and then it goes back into your deck and it creates a knight. I'd be using the bottom of this card constantly. It seems really really good to me. That'd be my choice. Level eight's hilarious. Um, I want to play with endless numbers just because it is the funniest thing that I've ever seen. We haven't talked about items, so let me just do a brief aside on items. I'm not going to go into an item guide for Bone Shaper. There are some pretty obvious uh, items that benefit having summons. Buy those items. They're great. They let you or your summons do all the things and cheat the summon rules and so on and so forth. And then you suck at moving. So maybe cards that help you move a little bit more. Other than that, you don't really need anything. You don't need any cards that make you better at attacking because it's your skeleton's job to attack. Um, maybe a card that like lets you do something cute and throw net on bad guys or whatever. I don't know, whatever. But really, things that support your, your, your minions or let you command your minions um, make a big difference here. This card, the reason I mentioned that... Uh, asks your skeletons to end their move on this summon if they do it eats them and when it eats them it starts doing more damage um, and also when it takes damage you can destroy the skeletons that it would that it ate so you can kind of make this like nearly unstoppable monster if you can get your skeletons onto this card so funny so thematic so hilarious seems awkward to set up um you need to have the right cards for it you probably need to be playing more of those move your summon cards that i had maligned earlier um so i'd love to try this card i just haven't personally um and then the bottom of this card granting some of your summons the ability to move and then wound people around them yeah sure whatever i'm here to make a bone horde i don't really care about that all right let's talk about wailing from beyond um first of all this is a card where I'm attacking. That's hilarious. That's not my job. That's the job of Winston and Claudia and all my other friends. Uh, <laughs> and the strange thing is it does benefit you for for your allies, your summons being near the people that you're attacking, which you can attack multiple of them. Um, seems like a fine card. Honestly, I'm playing this card for the bottom, though. Move three, heal three is pretty good stuff. Uh, if you have a green, you get to throw a ward on people. I think a ward by level eight is even more impactful. That's probably what I'm playing this card for. So if I'm looking for bottom actions to bolster, I'm grabbing Wailing from Beyond. If I'm looking for nonsense, I'm grabbing Endless Numbers because it's hilarious. And then of course, there's always the goofiness of the level nine cards. Here we are. Um, let's, let's talk about Mihold the Shrouded Sun. The next enemy that kills one of your summons this round gains Bane. Um, 
I would need to go back and read the rules for this because I think if you gain Bane on your turn, I think the text says you don't take the 10 damage until the end of your next turn. I think. So I'd have to check that. If that is true, then I don't think the top of that card is that great. If I'm wrong about that and it triggers at the end of their turn, basically they just take 10 damage at the end of your, their turn, that's really cool. <laughs> Especially if you have piles of skeletons. Um, so I quite dig that. The bottom here, two damage to yourself. Everyone within five suffers one. Yeah, that's fine. Um, you're not usually up in the mix. So I don't. I think you're using this for the top ability and assuming that I've read the rules incorrectly about how Bane works. Uh, I'll be honest though, I'm really looking over at this card. Just the idea that my, my skeletons are even more powerful than before. Range summons are really good. Most ranged summons don't last for long, but this guy's got six hit points, so he's probably going to be a little bit, a little bit better. And when your summons kill an enemy with a range attack, which is really probably just this guy, because you're probably not using Banshee at this point in time, um, making some elements. I've already complained about elements, so I quite like the top of this card. And then the bottom of this card is bananas. Ignore all damage abilities on your on your ability card. So you put this out on the first turn. I mean, imagine playing this card with this card. I don't, I don't take six damage. That's amazing. I love that. So I'm taking Unholy Prowess when I hit level nine uh, as this character. Like that just seems, that just seems the way to go to me. All right. Um, let's, let's, let's wrap up with talking perks. All righty. I'm not going to talk all these perks because that's a lot. Um, we're just going to talk about a couple of them. So, you know, these ones at the top, these basic change your negative ones into zeros and get some curses or poisons, totally respectable, negative twos into zeros. Um, I actually quite like that one. A lot of people generally do, but it's especially more so with skeletons that are always attacking at base too. It just always feels bad to do zero damage. This doubles the chance that you're gonna do zero damage because there's always the miss card in your deck. So removing that minus two for me emotionally was a really big deal. Um, this card right here replaces zero with a plus one, kill the attacking summon to instead add plus four. Seemed stupid to me, and I put a couple in my deck, and I loved it. It was so much fun. Um, a zero up to a plus one is is fine. You know, it's it's not better than any of these other changes. These other changes are better. But the option every once in a while of an extra three damage that could make the difference between an enemy dying or not, goodbye, skeleton. I am done with this enemy. Um nice flexibility on this card and also just thematically hilarious absolutely loved it um this next one add three heal the the bone shaper uh uh rolling cards amazing um you are always low on health you always need health and so i found putting these in my deck i would have skeletons attacking randomly healing me um i would thank them by name um <laughs> They were so good. Honestly, I, I couldn't recommend them enough. I think they really make a nice difference. A lot of, the, a lot of nice incidental differences um, along the way here. I've already complained about resource generation, so I did like that card. This Acer card is, I think, a no-brainer. Should be your first one. Ignoring scenario effects and adding two plus one cards is just very, very, very good. Uh, take it. It's your, it's your first one. It's just amazing. Um, the one after that I was very excited about. Immediately before each VRS, you may kill one of your summons to perform a blessing on yourself. I had found after I played the first few scenarios that because of card management, I was crumbling skeletons so I could have even cards. And I was like, oh, and I get an extra bonus with the blessing thing here. The more I ended up playing this class, the less I ended up crumbling my skeletons or the more often they ended up being dead anyway. Um, as I leveled up, it was more and more likely that enemies would definitely one-shot my skeletons rather than maybe one shot my skeletons at the lower levels and so i think that um this ended up being quite disappointing as a perk i would not take this perk again um until like one of the very end ones the only and the other reason i took this perk is because i wanted to achieve this this mastery of uh sorry this mastery of killing at least 15 of your summons which is like really really hard to pull off it's just you need to have so many summons you need to be the one who kills them um, it's, I, I took this card and this perk and I just, I still wasn't even accomplishing it, um, by a, like a, by a long shot. So, uh, yeah, ended up being pretty disappointing to me. 
This next card is amazing. I didn't take it until way later, and that was a huge mistake because it was so helpful. Like I said, I had one ally, and I that's the reason why I didn't take this, because it's one character ally. If they would exhaust by taking damage, I can take two damage to make them go to one instead, uh, which I'll call the Half-Orc Relentless ability from D&D. Um, really, really cool. And very flexible. It just It's a nice once-a-scenario use, and if you have allies that are taking the hits for you, um, this saves them from losing a card at the expense of two of your health. By the time you're at the scenario where your allies are exhausting, you've probably pulled out of the tailspin and have a middling amount of health, so you can afford this two health. Really, really, really like this card. I can't speak to this bottom one because I didn't go for it. Having two uh, uh, perk boxes just seemed like a lot. I really wanted to improve my deck. When I first was playing this character, I was like, ah, oh, there's skeletons, whatever. And then I realized that improving your deck is more important than improving your deck on almost any other character because you make more attacks per round than most people do. So having a better deck is better for you than it is for most people. So spending two of my perks that could improve my attack deck on an ability that I was not so sure about, um, I didn't like. That being said, putting a skeleton into play right at the beginning of the game is a big game. That's definitely, I mean, I, the number of turns where I was just like, I'm going slow and I'm summoning a skeleton on my first turn is 90 plus percent, right? Um, having a second skeleton right off the bat is is a much stronger start. I, I absolutely see the power of this card. I'll tell you why I didn't take it. It's because by playing a level one card, I then have an 11 card hand and I just love card efficiency so much. So going from six cards plays until rest rather than five or sorry going from six down to five plays until rest it just broke my heart a little bit so i didn't try this one i see its strength i think if it excites you you should grab it i think if it's not, if you're as skeptical as i was just improving your deck is gonna pay nearly as many dividends you just have to acknowledge that you're gonna have a little bit of a slower start um than players who maybe would pick that up Cool. Well, that is our Frost Haven video. Let me know if this uh, worked for you, if you enjoyed this, if this was valuable, if it was too long, was too short. Um, but hopefully this gives those of you who are interested in Bone Shaper, which is just one of the most fun classes I've played in this game. I, The idea of summons is really fun, and I think they really nailed the design on this one. Um, the ability to, to expend your health to impact the battlefield made it so that your health as a ranged or like as a backline character was a very relevant and and needed to be managed resource the skeletons and like where they would go and where you would summon them very tactical i just I really loved the gameplay flow of this character um all the way through and and i hope you do as well so hit me up if you have any questions i certainly can weigh in on any of your um questions about the bone shaper or or my drifter buddy <laughs> if you like uh great thanks everyone have a wonderful day